The thrill and joy of getting some recognition pales in comparison to that moment of seeing a new band on a gel that turned out to be mTOR. It's about being in the hunt. It's the excitement of being in the hunt to know that you're working on something that's important and challenging. You may not get there. There's unbelievable joy of that process. Hello, everyone. Welcome you to another episode of the series of Intervening, The Eminent Scientist, organized by the Department of Chemistry, University of Colombo, to have meaningful discussions with great personnel who've been contributing with enormous work towards the advancement of science. I'm Carl de Madhuanta, the fourth year undergraduate at the University of Colombo. To continue with this discussion today, we have Dan Pereira, Jasmine Premadasa Kumara Siri, Madhushani Ari Ratna, and Dinu Kanuan as the co hosts. First of all, I shall invite Diane to introduce today's eminent scientist to the audience. Thank you, Kavinder. Uh, Professor Stuart S. Schreiber is currently a scientist at Harvard University and has been the co founder of the Broad Institute. He has been active in chemical biology, especially investigating the use of small molecules as probes of biology and medicine. Professor Stuart Schreiber worked as a professor at Yale University from 1981 to 1988 before joining the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Harvard. He is the Morris Leo Professor in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Harvard and Harvard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. Notably, he has been a founding co-member of Broad Institute since 2003. Being an icon of the field of chemical biology, he was the founding director of Harvard's Institute of Chemistry and Cell Biology in 1997. Some of his pioneering research work include uh, mapping the first membrane to nuclear signaling pathway, uh, which is the calcium, calcineurin and fat pathway, co-discovery of M2-dependent neutron response signaling network along with sabatini, and the discovery of histone diastylins. He coined the term molecular glues for the bifunctional small molecules, uh, which act by inducing proximity of signaling proteins. His outstanding work in the field has led to the development of safe and effective therapeutics through diversity-oriented synthesis. He is an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. For his exceptional achievements, he has received many accolades, including Arthur C. Cope Award, Nagoya Gold Medal, and most notably, he was awarded the Wolf Prize in Chemistry in 2016. Thank you, Diane. Over to you, Jasmini, to start off with the discussion. Good morning, Professor Stuart. Good morning. So before we begin our discussion, other than talking about science-related work and career, initially, I would like to know about your childhood memories, your family background, a bit about your hobby. Oh, I'd be delighted to tell you about that. But actually, let me start by saying the um, reason I'm so happy to be here is that you all represent the next generation of scientists and you d maybe don't know how lucky you are to have been born when you were because you enter into a period of science where the potential to impact society is enormous. To be honest, there's a little pang of jealousy that I have <laughs> because of the opportunities that, that you will have. And so, um, you know, I'm here today, uh, I'm hoping to be helpful to you in some way. So let's start with your question. Um, when I think about my my childhood and the memories, to be honest, they really center around my mother. So I was very lucky to have um, a loving, supportive mother. Um, and that was important because in fact, the childhood was challenged in, in a lot of ways. It was challenged also for her 
And so we sort of banded together and, um, you know, she helped me navigate those challenging times. I would also say it was a confusing time. Um, my family was very good at keeping secrets. <laughs> and those secrets led to a, a lot of the confusion. But to have an angel in your life, as I did, a mother whose unconditional love could always divert, you know, periods of confusion or, um, you know, discomfort or, uh, and, and take it back to what she was so good at, which was love and support. Uh, it makes all the difference in the world. So when I think about my childhood memories, um, that's, that's, that's what I think about. Now, um, maybe later we'll talk I, how it happened, but it was really by, by chance I discovered science and the truth is early, well, not early, maybe college, you know, uh, I discovered science. And even that was by chance. I, I had actually quit college because I was sort of um, without direction. And um, science turned out to fix a lot of the problems. Uh, I didn't focus on confusion. I didn't focus on unhappiness. I focused on the excitement of, of science. And then the irony is that the combination of the support of my mother and discovering science, many, many decades later, pretty late in my life, I was able to actually use science um, to resolve some of the mysteries of my life, some of the secrets of our family. I discovered um, two families, my mom's family, and, and her dad, who she had kept a secret, and my, my own dad, who she had kept a secret. And that led to um, suddenly understanding all of the challenges I'd had as a child. And it, it uh, was very joyful, not to mention the fact that it allowed me to develop very deep and loving relationship with the two new families in my life. Wow, Professor, that is a great thing to hear. So my next question is about uh, your graduate studies. How did that experience influence you to have a successful career? Yeah. So after this sort of chance discovery in, in college, I, I said I'd quit and then I came back and stumbled into a chemistry class that just I didn't understand, but it, it, it seemed so beautiful and so awesome. Uh, and my my thinking turned around very quickly, and I started figuring out how you can advance a career in science. And I had never heard of graduate school, but you know when I did, I got excited about it, and I started reading about um, different scientists I, I might um, train, you know, receive training from. And I was lucky that. I discovered my advisor, um, he was a great organic chemist named R.B. Woodward. And I was lucky that, um, you know, Harvard University took a, a risk, a, a chance on me because um, again, I had done well in science, but I had a bit of a checkered past. And so they, they, they accepted me into their program and, and Woodward accepted me in, into his lab. It was very different times back then, uh, graduate school in the 1970s than, than you all may experience in, in, in the near future, but it, it fit for me. Woodward wanted and expected um, a high degree of independence, and that, that, that fit with me. I, that's what I wanted. Um, I will tell you that, you know, Woodward was a, a, a huge figure in the field. And I was very young and honestly a, a, a bit immature. And so I kind of idolized him. I thought he was, you know, he was clearly a great scientist, but then I would look at all, all the things that he did in his life and I would say, well, then I, I, I should do that and I should do that. And I came to realize later, and one of the great teachings of graduate school was that 
Um, you can be a great scientist, as Woodward was, but it doesn't mean he was out without flaws. And I think a little bit later in life, when I started to develop my independent lab, I I started to realize that some of some of his behavior, some of his attitudes, were actually not a good role model for me. They didn't they weren't aligned, let's say, with what my mother had taught me. And so um, I was able to benefit from an advisor who taught me about science and get me thinking about science. But in a funny way, I was able to learn from him in terms of how I wanted to navigate my life, sometimes in a way that was very different from his. But it, it did take me, uh, it took me a little while. Graduate school is a, it's an amazing period of, I think, many people's lives. Very formative. Um, probably the most intense period of my life. Um, and, and when things are extremely intense, sometimes they're, they're, you're not exactly at equilibrium. The things get extremely high and extremely low. And then over time, you, you sort of, you know, you have time to reflect. And I've said it many times, but I'll probably continue to say it. I, I, I hear my mom's voice and her, her guidance to me that, that I use to this day that helps me now get, I think, more to an, an e a healthy equilibrium. Uh, moving on to the next question. Professor, what inspired you to choose chemistry and more specifically organic chemistry? Sure. Um, well, I, I, I mentioned that I had quit college and um, another very influential person in my life was my sister. And, and she asked me why I quit. She was very supportive of it. But it was because I told her that, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do. But when I told an advisor what I wanted to do, that advisor told me, well, you're not capable of doing that, essentially. Um, so I quit. <laughs> and she said, you can quit, but not for that reason. And that's when I went back, you know, after missing the first three weeks of my first year of college. Um, and what happened first with that, that was the transformational moment of my life. Um, I went into a chemistry lecture hall, many, many students. I had no idea what was going on. I, I didn't even understand why students had lecture notebooks. I, I'd never heard of anything like that. So, and and um, I had worked uh, prior to college in what's called work study. So I only went to high school for three years and three hours in the morning. And mostly it was um, learning trades you know, I, um, and so I asked them, how did they know to have a notebook? And they looked at me like I was crazy, you know, but while, while they were looking at me oddly, I, I noticed that the, the, the professor was using colored chalk on the board. Uh, that, that professor is, he's still alive today. I had a good opportunity to share my gratitude with him recently. His name is Russell Grimes at the University of Virginia, because the day he wrote on that chalkboard with colored chalk was the day that changed my life. And what, it, what, it, what happened was um, he was drawing what today we would call D orbitals, the DXY, the very oddly shaped DZ squared. And he used blue and white orbitals, um, a chalk to draw the, the, the lobes of these orbitals. I had no idea what these things were, but I recognized them as beautiful works of art. And that moment, science went from, in my mind, something that was dull, grinding away, you know, memorizing stuff, to thinking that it was about beauty and art and life. So I was mesmerized and um, completely changed my life at, at, at that point. So chance entry into chemistry. Um, likewise, it was that first year that I went down to the bookstore. I was so excited. I said, like, is there anything else in chemistry? And the, the person told me, well, the next topic is organic chemistry. I had no idea what that word meant. So I, um, I bought the book. 
and I started reading about it. And I realized then that these, this was a subset of chemistry, organic chemistry, that dealt with the organic, the, the chemistry of life. And I started seeing molecules drawn. I didn't even know what the stick diagrams meant, but like the D orbitals, these three-dimensional structures that are molecules were spectacularly beautiful. They were three-dimensional. I, I, I wanted to see them in my mind's eye. I wanted to you know, rotate them around and see them from different angles. And so that's how I got involved in um, organic chemistry. Um, if you allow me, I'll take you to the next step, which is from organic chemistry with a just a laser focus on that in graduate school and so forth. And I, I had never heard of biology, had never taken a class in biology, but I think my transition from chemistry to organic chemistry to chemical biology was um, hearing about proteins. I loved in organic chemistry conformational analysis. And when I learned that proteins had amino acid side chains, I started wondering about the conformational flexibility of these things. And I talked to structural biologists and I realized they don't think about proteins that way. I thought, oh, maybe as an organic chemist, I have something to bring to this area. And then the next and last step I'll tell you about was um, now thinking about proteins and small molecules and their interactions. Uh, the first time I looked in a microscope and I saw a cell and I could see actually, um, it was a, it turned out a lucky cell line that had um, what the biologists then called whirling bodies. Um, it turns out it's, a, it's a, a process of what's called autophagy. I had no idea what any of this meant, but there was something dynamic happening and when I looked inside, uh, down the, the you know, into the microscope and saw these cells, I suddenly realized it's a sack full of organic chemistry. That's what it is. And, you know, when I read and learned about all the chemistry going on, the Krebs citric acid cycle and metabolism, I thought this boggles the mind. So organic chemistry can happen in such an ordered way and it must underlie all of life. And so that's the transition from, um, from wandering about um, disenchanted with life to a laser focus on chemical biology, organic chemistry and the organic chemistry of life. Interesting, Professor. So can you, uh, what are the ongoing projects, uh, research projects that you are engaged with so far? And can you share some unforgettable projects which you engaged with? One question that came up a number of years ago in thinking about cancer was with all the progress that's being made with what we call targeted therapies and immunotherapy, why is it that today still, unfortunately, the most common outcome of someone with the, the major solid tumor cancers, um, especially when they've progressed, is maybe a benefit from the modern treatments, but ultimately the effect of the drug goes away. And still it's very hard to cure patients with, you know, advanced solid tumors. And why is that? And so um, I went off and took some quiet time away from everything and forced myself, I literally said to myself, well, if I were from planet Venus and I came into earth and they told me there was this disease and they gave me the very basics of it without telling me about me mechanism, but they told me that there were drugs that made you better, but then the, the effect went away. Like, what would I do? And it was helpful to sort of clear away all of the biases that many people who study this problem of resistance would say. And, and it was fortunate because it took us to, for, for, for example, um, many, the answer almost everyone would say is, well, cancers mutate and they mutate away from the, the in, in a way that doesn't allow the drug to interact anymore. 
Turns out that's true, but that's something that happens very late. And what my lab discovered was that cancer cells have a plasticity. They can alter their cell state in much the same way that uh, a liver cell in our body is distinct from a skin cell on our body, even though they have the same genome. And that cancer cells can adopt a resistant cell state without any mutational changes. And that this is the very first thing that happens. Later, mutations arise and the, this resistant state becomes permanent through genetic mutations. So that part was right, but we missed an early, early aspect of resistance. And then the second thing happened was completely surprising, which is we realized that this altered state had shut down the ability to die. That's why it was resistant, but die by the common form of death called apoptosis. Turned out the mechanism of doing so conferred a vulnerability to a completely different kind of death. It's called feroptosis. And so that discovery, which we researched and, and published and described to the world, I'm happy to say is now progressing towards testing in humans through the formation of a biotech company. I wanted to say a word about that progress because it's going to repeat itself. Um, the, other, the other new area for us was to study a gene, famous gene called APOE, most famous because in the population, even amongst the, the uh, seven of us, there's some common variants of the gene APOE. Um, and those common variants, depending on which one you got from your mom and from your dad, can confer protection for our brains against diseases, including Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative disease. But they can also confer risk to those diseases, depending on which we call it allele you have of the gene. And my lab determined the mechanism of protection and risk, and it created, just like in studying cancer resistance, a kind of blueprint for a new kind of medicine to confer um, protection to brain health. Um, now that is now being explored in a new company, a biotech company. So the, in every case, the postdocs and graduate students who worked in my lab published their papers, but then they signed up to join a new company to pursue their discoveries in the lab and to test the hypothesis in humans. The third example I'll give you is what's very active in my lab right now. And it was mentioned in the intro introduction. The 30 years ago, we had a chance discovery that chemicals can induce protein-protein interactions. We called them molecular glues. Today, they're called all kinds of names, but they're all fundamentally the same. A common uh, example would be what are called protax that are, that are compounds that induce degradation of, of proteins. But there's just a huge range of important activities we can now confer on therapeutic targets using these molecular glues. And so up, up until recently, most of these had been discovered by chance. And so we focused on new technology that would allow you to pick one protein and another protein that biological mechanism would tell us if we could induce close proximity, information would be transferred in a way that would have a therapeutic benefit. So we've developed some new technologies and now those are being applied to make medicines, to test these hypotheses in humans again. And that's because postdocs and graduate students in my lab did that work, published it, and have now joined a new biotech company. Why am I mentioning biotech companies? You know, it turns out early on in my career in the late 1980s, I had no idea about this notion of a biotech company, um, a chance encounter with an investor, uh, his name is Kevin Kinsella, came to visit me. And I was bewildered by the things he was saying. I had no idea. 
But what I got out of it was that I was doing these basic research in my lab. And this was an investor who was recognizing that there could be societal benefit and new medicines. And um, that was uh, inaccessible to me. And here he was offering to work with me to start a company. That company uh, we discussed is today called Vertex Pharmaceuticals. I'm very proud to say 30 some odd years later, um, Vertex tackled a, a disease called cystic fibrosis. It was an untreatable disease. And today, if you have if you have cystic fibrosis, you can live a long and normal life. You, you have to take your medications, but they're Vertex medications. So it took a little while to reflect on this and to realize this is actually something that should be done purposely. Basic science research done in a laboratory, in a university, but to think about how to impact on society and mitigate suffering and death from disease and to partner with the investment community to create the vehicle to do that, that being biotech companies. Professor, one of your pioneering research findings is uh, revealing how FK506 and rapamycin bind to FKB12 and uh, insights into how phosphatase calcineurin is inhibited to explain the uh, cell biological and signaling effects of FK506. So could you briefly describe your work on this matter and how has it influenced further research on the same subject? Sure, I'd love to. So it was actually that work that is how we stumbled upon this notion of molecular glues, it's chemicals, small molecules that induce interactions between one protein and another that would normally not interact. So that was a very puzzling and surprising and um, interesting you know, observation. But it also could have been something that was just understanding a mechanism and people would agree that it's unusual and then you would move on. But a couple of things happen. Um, that work was being done in the context of studying what at that time was really a very mysterious aspect of biology called signal transduction. What we knew is that a protein like an extracellular hormone could interact with a receptor on the surface of a cell and without ever entering into the cell, it could influence all kinds of intracellular events all the way into the nucleus where very specific genes would become transcribed. How on earth does that happen? How does something outside of a cell never enter in influence an intracellular event? That, that was called signal transduction, still is today called signal transduction, but it was called the black box of biology. And that, that's a reference to you know, we just don't know what's going on inside of the black box. Now, as we made this discovery of molecular glues, um, it was becoming clear that the mechanism was a series of induced protein-protein associations, including that extracellular hormone that would bind its receptor, but not in a one-to-one -one manner. It would bring two receptors together. And many of those receptors on the inside of the cell had uh, an enzymatic activity, like a, a kinase activity. And so two kinases sitting now close together, they phosphorylate each other. So an extracellular binding event influenced the rate of chemistry inside of the cell without the protein ever entering the cell. And then it turned out that, what was the effect of that? Well, other proteins would normally not interact with the intracellular portion of the protein, but if it was phosphorylated, it would bind the phosphorylated site on the protein. And those enzymes would have substrates that were in the vicinity of the inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. And so chemistry would occur more rapidly. This just repeated itself over and over, every step of the signal transduction pathway, all the way into the nucleus, where we now know, step after step after step, 
involves induced protein-protein associations, usually through things like post-translational modifications. So that led to this idea that if this is how information is transferred, usually through proteins, and we have small molecules that induce protein-protein associations, let's extend the concept. One of the first things we did is we went from these molecular glues, these are sort of little small little globular molecules. And um, we, we said, well, one way to do it is to find a binder to one protein, find a binder to another protein, and then link them up with a chemical connector. Today, those are called bifunctional compounds. And it went from molecular glues to bifunctional compounds. Like um, I mentioned Protax earlier, those are bifunctional compounds. But now with new technology, we've gone right back to not needing the linkers anymore and going back to molecular glues. So I think, um, I think right now in chemical biology, as it relates to drug discovery, probably one of the most active areas of research involves these molecular glues or bifunctional compounds. So that's a story of how a chance discovery in the laboratory ended up having um, an influence on you know, chemical biology and biological questions like signal transduction and new medicines today in a completely un unforeseen way. The way you, are, you have explained is very informative and interesting. So other than that, I have another question, Professor. Like the decoding the mystery of the mTOR and signaling was another impactful work you, have, you were involved in. So we do like there are several other researchers also involved in that work. So can could you please briefly explain the key finding, how mutual incorporation between all of you help you throughout that journey? Sure. So when we were studying the molecular glue that I was just describing, it's a compound, two compounds called FK506 and cyclosporin. We learned that there was a third compound at that time, a third. Today, honestly, many tens of thousands, but you know, um, we, we definitely knew there was another compound, a natural product called rapamycin. And we knew that it acted like a molecular glue, just like, in fact, very much like FK506, because one of the interacting proteins was the same for FK506 and for rapamycin. The other interacting protein was different for FK506 and rapamycin. We knew rapamycin was a molecular glue, and we didn't know what the other interacting target was. Now, what happened was um, we were also, as I just described, so excited um, to use FK506 and cyclosporin to sort of illuminate the mysteries of signal transduction. We got, we were very lucky. We teamed up with a, a good friend of mine and one of my scientific heroes, Jerry Crabtree, um, by chance over on the West Coast, and I'm on the East Coast of the United States, um, never had met each other. But I, I read a paper that he wrote, and I thought maybe it's related in a signal transduction sense to it. And we teamed up, and today um, we call what we studied the calcium calcineurin NFAT signal transduction pathway, calcineurin being one of the interacting proteins of FK506 and an NFAT being a protein that Jerry's lab had studied. And that was the first time from membrane, extracellular T cell receptor, all the way into the nucleus, we could map out a signal transduction pathway. Very, very exciting time. All the while we knew there's another one out there called rapamycin. So once we got our signal transduction you know, studies um, to a, a point where we were satisfied, I had a graduate student come in the lab and basically what uh, he did was, his name is Eric Brown, and he took the, the recipe that the postdoc who had discovered the FK506 molecular glue of 
a protein called FKBP and, a, and the calcineurin protein. And he just repeated it with, with rapamycin. And lo and behold, out comes a band on a gel um, that was not known, was a mystery. What is it? Um, it turns out that's the protein today we call mTOR. So we called this one protein I'd mentioned, it's called FKBP12, it's technical name. We had named it four or five years earlier, FK506 and rapamycin binding protein of molecular weight 12,000. That's what FKBP12. So we knew that rapamycin bound FKBP12, but we didn't know what its partner was. So I want to describe for each of you, uh, again, this really reinforced this transition from pure chemistry to chemical biology. You know, it was like magic. When, when, when I saw a band on a gel and realized by sequencing a little portion of the, the protein and comparing it to databases and recognizing this is a new, this is a previously unknown protein. It's not new, it's been there for a billion years, but it was never before known to humankind. And that, that is a feeling of discovery. You know, you realize you may be the first person on the planet to recognize the existence of this thing. And the fact that it was targeted by this natural product rapamycin was strongly suggested to us that it was really, really important for biology. But I wanted just to share with you the, the little moment of excitement that really for me cemented the idea that I want to do discovery science. I want to get that feeling again to feel like the first person. So, um, you know, then we studied mTOR for a long period of time. It turns out that another graduate student named David Sabatini, working in another part of the United States at, 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 in uh, Johns Hopkins, um, like my student, Eric Brown, had an idea to go and find that interacting protein. And um, he found the same protein. And so today, uh, we call that protein, we call FKBB12 is the target of rapamycin, but we call this new protein mTOR, which stands for the mechanistic target of rapamycin. It's the protein that rapamycin engages by this molecular glue mechanism that is the, the basis of rapamycin's um, both cellular and organismal effects. And from there, David's lab, he's now gone to do amazing science, um, illuminating details of the mTOR pathway that just never cease to surprise, very beautiful work. And my lab also, certainly in the earlier days, uh, was very excited about understanding what exactly does mTOR do? How does it do it? Uh, today, we call that the nutrient response signaling network. It's a central hub, mTOR, that takes input from different nutrients and stressors in the cell. It's like a multi-channel processor. They, they reach the same protein, but that protein mTOR remembers from where the signal comes from and, and then signals in different directions um, in an appropriate way. Just a... a a, a beautiful story in biology, once again, you know, made possible by chance discoveries in chemistry. In order to perform a better quantitative and qualitative analysis of any given sample, either wet lab or in silico work can be used. Professor, what is your opinion about the wet lab work and in silico work on behalf of biology or molecular biology or in the field of science? Uh, Danuka, that, that is a very, very timely question. So, and my answer today is completely different from what it had been maybe three decades ago, two decades ago, one decade ago, and then today. Um, you know, three decades ago, I had the fortune of working with uh, Martin Karplus, who had pioneered uh, what's called protein dynamics, computational ways to study the motions of proteins, for which he was later awarded the Nobel Prize. And it was exciting to use protein dynamics. It was very important in determining the structure. 
But we could also see the limitations that even though the dynamic proteins were key to their function and certainly key to how they interact with small molecules, the, the hope 30 years ago was that we could use that knowledge of the dynamic properties that a computer could tell us about to rationally design drugs and so forth. It didn't turn out that way 30 years ago, okay? Because there were other technologies that had to come along. Now, those other technologies, they evolved decade by decade. Today, the speed with which we can determine structure is re remarkably different with you know, cryo EM technology. But today with uh, algorithms like AlphaFold, we don't even, you know, we, we could go to a computer and a, like mTOR. If we had had this technology when we discovered it, we could have gone to a computer, fed the amino acid sequence, and out would come the structure of mTOR. Today, it's advancing. It's not quite there yet, but today we can ask, what are the interacting proteins and how will they interact? And how will the rapamycin interact and change that? So utterly, completely transformational. Okay. Now that's, I would say is up to today, but why do we need to pay even more attention to your question going forward? Well, I think you're all seeing it. I think the whole world has seen it. And just even in the past several months, um, we've heard about uh, AI, artificial intelligence. We've, we've seen it in a lot of ways. You know, you could even call the search engines of computers and, you know, there's a bit of artificial intelligence, but very, very, very primitive. So, uh, and we've learned about machine learning and uh, neural networks and, you know, various strategies for increasing the sophistication. So very recently, generative AI, which is different from a search engine in that it's not searching for something that you've asked specifically for. It's actually asking to generate new knowledge, to, to put things together in a spooky kind of intelligence. Um, and you know, you've heard about the uh, large language models. So these allow disparate data sets to be transformed into the language, into language, and then and then to go across different data sets or training sets of many, many types. Right now we're learning about, you know, Reddit and uh, Amazon. Uh, reports from customers and so forth, but it's it's also going to very soon be biological databases, the the genomic databases, the transcriptomic, the proteomic, the metabolomic databases that'll all be transformed into representatives that use language, and then a machine that can commingle these. And because the machine uses language, you can now interact with the machine. The machine can be your personal assistant, but it has a, a level of understanding knowledge, not creativity yet, um, but still uh, a, a kind of stunning level of ability to synthesize. You know, so today you've heard about chat GPT and it can write you know, it can answer a question that may be an exam question, for example. It can, you know, networks are now using it to to create a script for the for the network news. I mean, it's 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 generative and it's amazing and it's impact that language, large language model based generative AI, I think is just beginning to have an impact on science. So I I think that minimally. All scientists that do bench work will have their own personal assistant. It'll work 24 seven. It will be unbelievably knowledgeable and, and helpful in suggesting things. And you can, you if the suggestion comes back that you don't like, you can say, well, um, I think you should, maybe you're too influenced by mouse data. What would happen if we restricted our analysis to human data only? Would something new happen? And then the machine, your assistant will come back to you and say, 
Well, under those circumstances, I come to a different conclusion. Here it is. Now, it's not that they're going to, the machine's not going to give you the answer to everything, but the machine is going to direct you in ways that I think it would be, that, that will really magnify what humans can do, experimentalists doing research at, at the bench. So I see a, a, a future in the very, right around the corner where computational science and experimental science are interwoven in a way that we've never seen before. That's really interesting, Professor. So talking about the Broad Institute, which is a biomedical and genomic research center located in the USA, can you share some of your experiences of being the co-founder of Broad yes. Institute? Yes. So let me give you a little history of how it happened. First of all, I, I mentioned in the late 1980s, um, I learned about the the interplay between government funded basic research, um, basic discovery and investor funded, venture funded, uh, laser focused um, organizations that allow the translation of the discovery into new medicines. We call that venture capital and we call the vehicle a biotechnology company or shortened a biotech company. And I gave the example of Vertex, which I'm um, humbled and uh, um, very de you know, delighted by the, the impact that the scientists at Vertex ultimately had in medicine. However, it was partly reflecting about the biomedical system that on the one hand enabled that to happen. Have an idea, write a grant, get funded, recruit students, work in a university, do experiments, interpret them, write a paper, then fortunately be you know, contacted by a venture investor, form a, a very focused company and work down that path. And as I said, the, the consequence has been largely um, taking a, a, a a disease for which there were no medicines to one which makes it a very manageable disease. So that's great. On the other hand, it took 25 years before Vertex ever was able to have a first sale. Now, investors put money in. They, they're not entirely altruistic. They like the fact that they're working towards something that's for the good of society but they also expect a return on their investment. And today, if I said to any investor, I have a great idea and help me start a company. And 25 years later, well, you'll have a good return on your investment. They would walk away uh, with zero interest. So it was the recognition of the need for new models that led to uh, three colleagues of mine, David Altshuler, Eric Lander, and Todd Gollum to sit down and sort of brainstorm for over a one year period on what is a new academic structure that we could make that would address some of these shortcomings. One, we decided to be very focused and it took us a year, but we came up with a mission statement, which is to propel the understanding and treatment of disease. So whereas many universities, you know, are very sort of blue sky, and you could be a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We decided to be very focused. Two, we recognized that science needed to be done at a larger scale than had been done. It had been done, um, you know, in a, I say this in a very positive manner, the, the beauty of the academic world is like an artist colony. Everybody's off doing really creative things and you kind of hope they, they come together in some way. But it, it, it didn't allow you to ask, uh, or to answer very basic questions at that point in time, 20 years ago. Like, how many genes are there? What are they? How many distinct proteins? How many metabolites? Where are they made? What the, Every cell has the same genome. Which cells make which proteins? How is that regulated? So biology at that point was unbounded. A lot of people said, there's 100,000 genes. How did they come to that? They said, well, uh, you know, a mouse has 20,000 and we're at least five times smarter than they are. So, 
Well, it turned out um, it was no longer a question of guessing how many. It was like, here's the list. So that was one of the goals of the Broad Institute was to make biology more bounded and to know what the parts list is and so forth. We really had to be deeply collaborative. It wasn't, um, you know, a bucket brigade where a chemist makes a cool compound and tosses it over the fence to a biologist who does something and tosses it over the fence to a, a, a translational clinical researcher and out comes a medicine. But we thought if we could focus on a question like, how do we take out a disease? That would force us in the beginning to bring um, the medical community, with the biological community, with the physics community, with the math community, with the chemistry community, with the computer science community. And we would work as a team from the beginning with a very focused question of, you know, what is schizophrenia and how can we overcome it with a medicine? So the, the, those are things that I think work well. Professor, you have uh, authored many publications and received many awards throughout your career. So can you share some memorable event moments uh, which you had experienced with such accolades and how do those things inspire to, for you to perform better with research work? Sure. You know, I'll give you an honest answer uh, and, and a very specific one. Uh, but, but first I want to preface what I'm going to say by, I think I go all the way back to where I started with you that, you know, I had a, a, a troubled, uh, life as a, as a, as a young person. And, and I discovered science and the joy of science. And I think that, um, it's really important for all of us to live a, a, a great life, a happy life, and a life hopefully that has some impact to never get away from the joy of the science. So sometimes, you know, as you evolve, you get late, you get later in your career, um, recognition comes along and, and people, um, you know, you know, for me, uh, Kavinda, again, you mentioned, I, I got a call from the president of Israel. Uh, uh, I actually thought, it was a spam call <laughs> and I was not, uh, what I said was not appropriate in terms of, you know, what he was offering to tell me this great news about receiving the, the Wolf Prize. Um, but I think what I'm trying to say is that, and I want to answer your question about uh, awards and recognitions, is that the thrill and joy of getting some recognition pales in comparison to that moment of seeing a new band on a gel that turned out to be mTOR. Now, that's not to say that you, you, you can't be grateful and, and, and happy when your colleagues recognize. And, um, and now, I, now I wanna answer your question by telling you a little story about what can come out of it. Um, I had never been to Israel before. And uh, I was able to go to Israel and spend a week um, uh, during the the ceremonies of receiving the, the the Wolf Prize, and I visited the Knesset, I visited uh, the president's home, uh, I spoke to uh, an audience, including the president and a young Israeli uh, woman, um, and it turned out from very different experiences and unprepared, we gave talks that talked about the value of science that were stunningly coordinated, seemingly. These are very, very special experiences for me and my wife who, who joined me. So, you know, there can be really very uh, awesome uh, consequences of you know, the, the chance recognition of, of that sort. And I, I appreciate them, but I, I very quickly go back to my lab and just hone in on the things that um, bring me the greatest joy. I, I use a phrase that uh, often with my wife, when she's judging whether things are going well or not, and she'll tell me, you know, you've been talking about your excitement about this problem, and you now tell me that you solved the problem, but I don't see the great joy that you had while you were trying to solve the problem. And I told her, you know, it's about being in the hunt. It's the excitement of being in the hunt 
to know that you're working on something that's important and challenging. You may not get there. There's unbelievable joy of that process. Now, if you're lucky and you get there and you figure it out, it's awesome, it's great, but it's also temporary because it's a little unnerving because now what, you solved the problem? So, so now what? And so the, the answer is find the new problem, get back in the hunt, feel the joy and excitement of, of science by being in the hunt. So Professor, as the very last question, Professor, it would be greatly appreciated if you can share some advice for the current undergraduates and researchers. We would love to hear that, Professor. Um, well, I'm always leery to give advice. And so my first piece of advice is be critical of people like myself offering advice. <laughs> Why? Because we're all different. We're all special. We're all different in various ways. And the most important thing to, to recognize is it is your life. You get to live it. No one else can tell you what to do. So clearly I'm not gonna tell anyone you know, what to do, but in a way I just gave you some advice. <laughs> um, so the, I think, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll share a piece of advice that I received when I was still very young in the 1970s. Um, it was a, 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 then a Harvard professor that I had never met before. Is he, he passed very recently, very sadly. He's a very sweet and special man. Yoshido Kishi. Um, I called him Yoshi. And in the 1970s, he was a kind man who, um, so for some reason, took uh, an interest in me in sort of mentoring and, and helping. And he said something one day that was very puzzling but it stuck with me. To this day, I think about this. At the time when he said it, I had no idea what he meant, but it, it felt important. So I did hold on to it. So what did he say? He said, Stuart, it takes 10 years to do something of real significance in science. If you're lucky, you'll live a long and fruitful scientific career. And so he used the word, the number. He said, so, you know, maybe you'll have four of these 10 year periods. So you can only really work on four things. So choose your problems carefully. Pick something that you know one, most importantly. You will have a passion for. You, you will wake up every morning. Yeah, earlier I used the word feeling like you're in the hunt. Find something that you care about. It doesn't matter how hard it is. It doesn't matter how doable it is. Um, work on things that you care about. And devote the time and energy to get to a point when you, when you reach this, you know, the, the worst moment, you say, I'll never solve this problem. Be persistent push through it. Eventually you'll get there, but it may take 10 years. So um, it turns out for me personally on reflection, uh, Yoshi's advice was uh, remarkably spot on. If I look back in my life, both scientifically and even, even the, the personal side of, of you know, Scientists still live in a world where you, you have non-scientific things happening, big things happening in your life. And I would say that for me, the, the big problems took 10 years. It turns out 10 years plus or minus three. Some took 13, some took seven, but not bad, you know. And um, you've already heard little bits of it. Like there was the, the pure chemistry phase until I started thinking about, that was about 10 years, until I started thinking about um, 
dynamics of proteins and chemistry inside of cells, that sort of chemical biology phase took about 10 years, maybe more like 13. Um, and more recently, it's been thinking about impacting medicine, impacting human health. So each of these are transitions. They made me feel good they, that they were, um, I felt like I was in the hunt. The, um, the maybe the, the very last thing I'll tell you is not a piece of advice. So that's the, that's, that's the advice I wanna share with each of you. But when if you do tackle those problems and they're hard, you may be surprised that you might think, well, at least people will be rooting for me. And that's actually not always the case. Um, you think, um, you know, a lot of success will come my way and that's not necessarily gonna be the case. So there are times when you'll feel challenged. So I have two thoughts that come in my mind when I feel uh, challenged. One I learned from my mom. She never used these words, but as a, as a kid, I translated what she taught me because I had this world that had a lot of um, challenges and not a happy life. And then I had the angel in my life who created a whole different universe for me. She would tell me, she was a Cajun from Louisiana. She would say, sugar, have I told you how much I love you? Or sugar, have I told you how wonderful you are? And I would, of course, just say, no, no, tell me more, tell me more. So I internalized that with the phrase, I refuse to be unhappy. When these other things happen, turmoil, problems, I would say, you know what? I'm going to compartmentalize. I'm going to go back to my mother and I'm going to say, I refuse to be unhappy. So that's one, one of my sort of coping mechanisms when things get challenging. The second one is something that you maybe haven't heard of, but it's, I find it very inspiring. Uh, it's, it's, it's an old quote. I won't be able to, uh, I won't be able to uh, recite the entire quote, but it's a famous one. It's from a, 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 a United States president. His name was Theodore Roosevelt. And he went by Teddy Roosevelt. He was quite a character. Um, but you can Google Teddy Roosevelt in the arena. And he talks about being in the arena, which he meant tackling something that's important that you believe in. Others may not believe in you. It's okay. He talks about the fortitude of getting through these hard times. And again, I can't recite it, but I hope you'll Google it. Because when I'm very down at times, I will Google it and I will read it or go to an audio clip of it and I'll feel uplifted. The essence of it is it's be in the arena, tackle the important problems. If people don't believe in you, it's okay. Fight your way through it because it's okay to fail as long as you fail daringly. As long as you work towards something, it's okay to fail. It's okay. But if you fail on something trivial, that's not optimal. If you fail on something that you felt merited your attention, it's okay. You're in the arena. And that's the important thing. It's not getting there. It's not getting the recognition. It's be in the arena. I hope those words are useful to someone out there. Um, because you are, as I started by saying, the world is dependent on you. You are the next generation of scientists. You have a set of knowledge and capabilities that no one, no generation before you has ever had. What happens next is going to be very, very big. And each of you will be the ones driving it. People like myself, we're going to sit on the sidelines as long as we can and watch in awe 
as you are using large language models, as you're using new, new cryo EM capabilities, chemistry, physics, math, whatever it may be, to tackle problems of great societal importance. I wish you all the very, very best. That's really encouraging, Professor. Uh, so we have reached to the end of this interview. Thank you very much, Professor Stuart, for dedicating your valuable time out of your busy schedule and for sharing some valuable facts and your knowledge here with us today. Your participation is highly appreciated, Professor. And thank you again for spending your precious time with us today. Thank you. So today we have interviewed Professor Stuart Ed Schreiber at Harvard University. And we got to know many unseen things in the life of an eminent scientist. I strongly believe young scientists who are just going to begin their journey will also be inspired after listening to this wonderful conversation. Thank you all for joining with us today and stay tuned for another interview with an eminent scientist. Have a great day. Thank you.